welcome to our August 30th edition of Week to Week, the political roundtable from the Commonwealth Club of California. Uh, the usual housekeeping note, if you've got a cell phone or any little device that makes noise, if you could silence it or turn it off, um, that would be very much appreciated since we are live streaming and of course recording this for podcast and video online. Uh, I'm John Zipper, I'm your host for Week to Week. I know you all saw the big news today that uh, rapper Eminem has forced presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy to stop using his music in his campaign. <laughs> That's good news. I mean, the world kind of benefits twice. Ramaswamy is behaving himself, and we are exposed to less Eminem music. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. We have a lot to talk about, and we might not even get to all of it during our hour here. But uh, we've got a great panel. Let's meet them. Starting on the far end, we have returning champion, if you will, Melissa Kane, <laughs> host of the Get Out the Bet podcast. She's also a political analyst, an attorney, and she's on Twitter at Constitution Mel. Welcome back, my sense. Yeah. In the middle and joining us for the first time is Josh Kane, different spelling, K-O-E-H-N. He's a senior political reporter at the San Francisco Standard. He's also previously an editor at the San Francisco Chronicle and was a communications director in the California legislature. He's on Twitter at Josh underscore Kane. Welcome. <laughs> and next to me is Tim Anaya. He's the vice president of marketing and communications at the Pacific Research Institute. He previously held a number of communications positions in the California State Assembly. Probably the two of them are like canceling each other's work from the opposite <laughs> sides of the aisle. And you can find him on Twitter at Tim Anaya. Welcome back, Tim. Thank you. We're coming to you from downtown San Francisco, and I wanted to talk about kind of the travails of downtowns these days, as well as attempts to revitalize them. I mean, it's no secret that big city downtowns have uh, been hurting in the wake of the pandemic, though business in general is booming again and unemployment is at kind of at record lows. Um, more and more of us are working from home most of the time. I'm one of them. And uh, there's been a huge drop in the number of people working downtown, coming downtown to shop, to have dinner, or to have lunch. And that, of course, has resulted in the closure of lots of businesses here. Um, that combined with a lot of businesses that have been downsized due to the fact that they don't need as much space. And you've kind of got a depression in office real estate markets. So some downtowns have sprung back better than San Francisco's has. Um, but, and of course here we've, been doubly hurt by the fact that the tech industry has both gone through a bit of a shrinkage as well as they're really having trouble uh, getting people to return to work. So um, that's been hurting us and you can guess where the hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes from uh, a healthy downtown, um, they're not coming here anymore. So cities are hurting overall. So let's, let's talk about what we're seeing here, and not just San Francisco, because it's happening in other places, but I wanted to start with San Francisco Mayor London Breeds. Uh, she's been kind of throwing a number of plans out there, and uh, only one of them, I guess, involves building a soccer stadium, but um, <laughs> that is one of them. So, so maybe start with you, Josh. Uh, what do you get uh, at the sense of the city leaders here? Do they have a grasp of what they can do or what they should do, and do they have, is there any consensus there? Yeah, uh, I think it's a great question that we're all kind of asking as uh, San Franciscans or Bay Area residents. Um, I actually recently wrote a 6,000 word profile of Mayor Breed, uh, tracing uh, her earliest years growing up in the Western Edition and, and how uh, her life growing up in public housing, uh, raised by her grandmother, uh, really uh, striving and, and making it out of an incredibly tough situation with a sister who died from a drug overdose, a brother in prison, um, and how those experiences shaped the way that she cre uh, crafts policy at City Hall. And while she's got an incredibly inspirational story, a lot of people are questioning what is her vision for the city. And that was something I really grappled with in the story. And I have to say that uh, while she is trying her best, I think a lot of people are wondering if best intentions add up to an actual plan. And so when it comes to the downtown recovery, um, you know, we've heard a soccer stadium uh, at Westfield Mall. We've also, same mall, been posed as uh, an option for lab space, uh, which was debunked within hours of it coming out. Um, I think, you know, she realizes that people are unhappy. She's unhappy. She's a true 
San Francisco, and she takes it very personal. Uh, but if she can't get things moving when it comes to finding uh, an answer to what do we do with the vacant towers, how do we fill those up with either uh, commercial uh, or how do we convert them into residential in an actually economically feasible way, um, she's not going to be able to get out of that. And, and one of the things that uh, my colleagues and I continue to ask the mayor's office and other elected officials in the city is, can you actually get people back downtown until you address some of the more bigger systemic issues when it comes to uh, drug addiction, homelessness, uh, crime, but also even to some extent a greater perception of crime than even the data shows. And of course, there's a lot of crime that goes unreported. But I think right now she has got, you know, several really heavy balls that she's juggling. And when it comes to a really coordinated strategy, that's something that we have not seen come to fruition yet. Does she have any friends that are not in politics? Right, I were, you know, she, she grew up here, right? Um, and you know, those of us who've been following her career remember running for District 5 Board yeah. of Supervisors and she was very real. Um, but now when some of the things they're proposing, like you know, what we need is more art festivals downtown. And you're like, that is not the answer. <laughs> the lack of art festivals is not the problem. <laughs> And not the solution, you know, like so. And I just you just look at her and you go, I worry that she's in a, a bubble of advisors and people with, you know, um, ideas that aren't grounded in what regular residents want. And ideally, somebody who's from here has folks, civilians that she can talk to and say, hey, what do I need to do? Because a lot of the proposals that we've seen so far, Alina you know, soccer stadium and things like that just seem, you know, completely untethered from people's real reasons why they're not going downtown, why we aren't going downtown. Yeah, you know? well, to answer your first question, Unlike Gavin Newsom, Mayor Breed does have friends. Like, <laughs> <laughs> she has, I didn't say that. I meant she has outside legitimate politics. friends outside of people who just work for her. Um, that she knows the thing is, she can't walk around San Francisco more than two blocks without knowing someone actually knowing them from uh, living here her whole life, aside from uh, going to UC Davis. Um, I think when it comes to her advisors. That is a big question because she keeps a small circle of advisors who are not the people she grew up with. So she's got people from her neighborhood and around the city trying to get at her and they have told me that they are a little bit worried that she is getting bad counsel. Meanwhile, she's got these uh, institutional players. Her chief of staff is Sean Ellsburn, a former supervisor. Um, she's got people that have worked uh, with State Senator Scott Weiner. Um, these people are trying their best to give her an idea of what they think would really help the city move forward. And at the end of the day, she keeps her own counsel. And, and that is, in some ways, one of her biggest strengths, because when she gets mad, she can really articulate that vision and she can get people on board and really tap into that angst that we all feel. But when it comes to strategy, live jazz, night markets, that's not going to do the trick. And so that is really the big question. So um, at a certain point, you know, sh your gut will only get you so far. And I think that is what we're seeing her struggle with a little bit. And it's going to be the biggest challenge between now and November of next year. Tim, what are you seeing? Well, I think you're right to touch on these underlying causes for certainly the, the decay of Market Street and other big cities in California, um, too. You know, when we look at crime, we look at housing, we look at the cost of doing business, the ease of doing business in the city, homelessness, and, you know, they all have their own root causes. But I think one thread you could kind of run through all of them is they have gotten predominantly worse because of really uh, the last decade or so of, I would call it primarily state, but also some local policy mistakes. And so take crime, for example. You know, we've had a huge shift in public safety policy at the state level over the past decade or so. And my colleague, Steve Smith, who A for Effort is here tonight to cheer me on, <laughs> uh, he wrote a terrific study on this for PRI called Paradise Lost. And he makes the case that as California was decarcerating and decriminalizing, 
Well, we've created an epidemic of mass victimization. And as he documents, there were over a million crimes reported in California in 2021, which is the latest year that we have data. And that's just what was reported. That's not what's going unreported. You know, on housing and building and development, you know, the state has made modest attempts to reform the California Environmental Quality Act, which is a lot of the source of the frustration for building projects, yet NIMBYism is alive and well in San Francisco and in Marin County and in even cities like uh, Huntington Beach and Southern California. And then you add other things that make it uh, very difficult to build, like you know, prevailing wage for housing construction is often a requirement. Um, and then just the general kind of attitude of it's so difficult and so expensive and so burdensome to do any kind of business in the state. So PRI does a lot of work on this. We have a center on kind of urban renewal that we call the Free City Center. And I'm going to give you all a preview. Next week, we have uh, a big paper coming out that we're calling the Free Cities Index. And we look at how pro-growth are the top 50 cities population-wise in America. And not surprisingly, San Francisco does not rank well on this list. It's actually number 44 out of the top 50 cities in America. Well, surprise. Yes. And so um, kind of our point is you're not really going to make a difference in revitalizing Market Street or San Francisco's downtown in general until you embrace pro-growth market-based policies. So you need to make it easier. You know, we need to welcome people who want to set up a business here and hire people and pay them good wages and generate tax revenue. And we need to make it easy to build all kinds of, uh, of housing. Um, you know, we want to have a city where people come and bring their families here and raise their kids here and have thriving culture and all of that. Um, so you need policies like school choice to ensure that kids have great schools to go to. And then, you know, on crime, you know, you need to hold people accountable. You need to address things like retail thefts that are really affecting retailers in this state huge. Tell me what you were telling me back there about the, the, uh, the bill that was uh, just... So, uh, you know, kind of a case in point of why I'm a little pessimistic that we're going to do these things. Just until this week in Sacramento, there was a bill that would, if it had been enacted, would have prohibited store employees from taking any proactive step to prevent goods from being stolen from their stores. Just this week, just the other day, public pressure forced them to amend those provisions out of the bill. But this is a bill that passed one house of the legislature already and was on the track to being enacted. So I think these, you know, <laughs> I know, I know. I'm only shocked that it didn't pass. I'm only, I agree <laughs> with you, I agree with you. So I think all of these issues, you know, it's kind of thinking small versus thinking big. And I think we need to, you know, think big to reimagine you know, downtown in San Francisco and LA and other big cities and what they could be. Uh, do you see any big cities that have weathered this very tumultuous past, gosh, five, six, seven years, but, but have managed it well? <laughs> Not in California, I would say. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> look, everyone's, every place has their problems, right? right? I mean, you, you, you look at places like even Austin or, say, Nashville, and they seem to do pretty well. They grew a lot, but that was also kind of part of the problem. They weren't really set up with roads and infrastructure to really handle all that growth. And so even places where people were flocking to had their own problems. So look, no one's perfect. But I think if we had to do it again, if something happens again, you might see San Francisco learning some lessons there about maybe not going so far with a lockdown as we did last time, uh, even though it did, uh, I think, help keep things uh, things in check for us. Um, maybe, you know, sort of trying to find a, a different balance there. So I think those are some lessons that we that we can learn from other places. And so that if we if we have this problem again, Lord forbid that, you know, we would we would handle it a, a little differently. And I think but that's part of what was so interesting is watching how every place allowed itself to to act 
in different ways. You know, Florida <laughs> had its own way. Uh, and, you know, and, and sort of we can look at the data now and see, see exactly how, how that works. But, and hopefully there'll be some lessons. Josh? Yeah, and, and I think it's worth noting that, uh, unfortunately, San Francisco's biggest strength is also somewhat of its biggest weakness in the recovery because we are so heavily dependent on the tech sector. This is an industry that essentially showed the way of how to do remote work and keep the economy afloat during the pandemic. So we saw record profits come in early in the first couple of years, and all of a sudden times were booming, and we're thinking, oh, okay, now when we get back, we're really going to be moving. But then it turns out they're like, no. It's, this actually works just fine for us. <laughs> and our workers don't want to come back because they like waking up and rolling it out of bed in their pajamas and then just starting their day. Like that 20 second commute. Yeah, instead of uh, playing ping pong until 9 p.m. in Mountain View. <laughs> so I mean, like, <laughs> you know, I, I think we, we do have to recognize that some things are just a little bit outside of the control of, of local government. And there are obviously then institutional systemic problems that have been allowed to fester over the course of years and decades. And so by, th you know, this, we look at what's going on with homelessness and addiction, which are so often intertwined, and mental illness, and mental illness and addiction. And so we're now having a actual discussion about whether we just do harm reduction or we also get a little bit more bold about treatment and abstinence-based programs, which has not been a discussion that was happening for years. And it, it's very much high time that that actually comes to the front because you're not going to be able to just give someone naloxone over and over and over and expect the street's conditions to improve. And, and so that's something that's going to be a very fierce debate in the next you know, year or so. It'll definitely play heavily in every supervisor race, the mayor's race. And, and then we look at the housing issue. Obviously, we've housed ourselves into a box uh, with, uh, you know, neighborhood opposition that in some ways is right. Uh, I wrote a story about a 50-story tower in the sunset and how it was essentially, uh, I don't know, uh, 25 times bigger than everything around it. And, and it looked, you know, uh, if you've ever seen like a e-cigarette, a jewel, it looks like a little stick. Well, we were calling it the jewel of the sunset because it's just like, you know, it pops out. It also doesn't help that the developer uh, was uh, sent to prison for a Ponzi scheme. Um, <laughs> And um, I, I've got so much to tell you about that story. <laughs> I went to the house. Okay, I went to the house in the sunset. This is just kind of jerk I am. And so I went over there, and I knocked on the door, and a woman came out, and I was like, hey, I'm trying to reach John and Raylene Hickey. They're the ones behind this project. And she's like, oh, no, they're not here. And I was like, oh, all right. Well, would you mind giving them a message? And then she looks at me for a few seconds. She goes, actually, I'm Raylene Hickey. I was like, fantastic. <laughs> and I was like, can we talk? And she's like, no, I have to go. And I was like, all right. Um, but these are kind of some of the bad faith actors we have in town. That's an extreme example. But um, when it comes to housing, homelessness, addiction, crime, in many ways, all of these things are uh, interwoven. And, and of course, the economy uh, is our ability to then fund the programs that we address these with. I think also, though, as everyone in this room probably is well aware, if you've lived in San Francisco long enough, the city is uniquely talented at throwing money and getting no results back. <laughs> and so, you know, when you look at a $14 billion budget, um, you have to ask yourself, where is the money going? Uh, there are programs that I was just having a conversation uh, today uh, with a source, and we were talking about how so many of the programs, because we have what uh, some people call a nonprofit industrial complex, and, and so so many of the programs that we have for treating addiction, helping people get off the streets, they're not even actually based in outcomes. It's not like how many people did you house or how many people did you help get clean. It's like how much outreach did you do? Like, did you contact people? Did they fill out a survey? And if that's your actual goal, is just to like throw it out there and not get anything back in return, that's how you waste money. And that's why people are rightfully upset. Uh, Melissa, as you know, uh, San Francisco was involved in a lawsuit uh, over what uh, has been termed as homeless sweeps. Um, and uh, the city has been fairly vigorously fighting that. And obviously, people are lining up on either side of that. Um, is this potentially a a, whichever way the, the final court decision goes, I mean, is this a major court decision, do you think? Or will this just be one more 
you know, rope marker on the highway. Well, I have to say it was incredible to see the mayor, to see three members of the Board of Supervisors, to see City Attorney David Chu out in front of the Ninth Circuit asking the judges, please let us deal with this homelessness problem. You know, please rule in our favor and really holding a rally. I don't know that you would have ever thought, even for London Breed herself, um, five years ago, or you know, would, uh, would be in that position where they're literally with a bullhorn, like we have to do something, please allow us to act. Um, so that's kind of incredible in and of itself. <laughs> um, but if the city is allowed to, if the city wins and the injunction is lifted, then yes, it will be a big deal. It would probably, it, depending, it might get appealed to the US Supreme Court, but at, at its heart, essentially in September of last year, um, and you correct me if I'm wrong, because the standard has written a lot of great stuff on this. Uh, in September of last year, um, the Coalition on Homelessness sued the city because they said the city was doing sweeps of, uh, of homeless people sort of moving their belongings without offering them shelter, which by a previous Ninth Circuit ruling about 20 years ago, the city is required to do. You have to offer shelter. If you don't and you just sort of move people off or you arrest them, then that's a violation of the Eighth Amendment a prohibition on unusual, uh, cruel and unusual punishment. Anyway. So the, the thing is, offer the shelter, they say no, then you can do the sweep and move people. So the Coalition on Homelessness sues saying, city, you have to stop because we don't have enough shelter beds. So this offer of shelter is illusory, which to be fair, I think is true. <laughs> I think we don't have enough shelter beds. I think this housing first policy has led to a diversion of resources to, to building ho you know, housing instead of just sort of temporary shelters. But that's, that's a different conversation. Anyway, so they say this is an illusory offer and so it doesn't count. Uh, and so you can't, you know, do the sweep. And so that is what is at issue, is if you offer shelter to people and they say no, which they often do, um, can you then act on it even though there may not be a shelter bed in reality somewhere for them? And so it is a really, you know, sort of dicey sort of philosophical question. But what's interesting too is, so the judge, a judge, a district court judge in Oakland agreed with the coalition on housing, on homelessness, sorry, and they ruled that you have to stop doing these sweeps. Right, this is again, it's, this is in December, they, this uh, magistrate judge in Oakland. The Ninth Circuit is now considering it. They heard oral arguments this past week on uh, the 23rd. Now, what's interesting is this magistrate judge who initially ruled for the Coalition on Homelessness is in Oakland, but the Ninth Circuit, of course, is here. And the Ninth Circuit is in that place right across from the Nancy Pelosi Federal Building where some folks aren't even allowed to go into work because <laughs> it was already dicey before COVID and it has gotten way weirder since then. And so I'm interested to see, do the judges themselves and their own personal experience of driving to this court while it's in session, uh, you know, sort of affect maybe their approach to the case. Uh, and if they do rule, of course, in favor of the city, it really opens up a lot more options for being able to designate certain places and hopefully will, uh, you know, be an impetus for actually building more shelter instead of just, you know, pursuing, just pursuing a, a housing first policy. So that's kind of, anyway, Tim, that's the overview. We've been following this issue at PRI and certainly the Boise versus Martin case, which is kind of the big case that started this all and kind of following it and how these legal issues have gone. I'm pretty pessimistic that the court will rule in the city's favor. It may take a test to the Supreme Court to see. Um, but I think, you know, to your point about, um, you know, kind of spending a lot of money on these things with no results, We've been a lot of work evaluating the, the main state government anti-housing program is called Project Home Key. It's a big initiative of Governor Newsom. And basically the premise is if you have the government buy motels, build new housing, we have a place for everyone, that basically is going to get the ball rolling to start you know, getting folks back on their feet. Well, if you look at the data, if you look at the census point in time counts that we've seen, homelessness is worse than ever before since we've uh, adopted this program. $12 billion spent statewide to date. Uh, when you talk about programs that aren't working, you know, the, uh, if you look in LA, there are these kind of homeless slash affordable housing projects that um, LA government has undertaken, cost a million dollars per unit to build million dollars and in San Diego I think 
their project that we just said was something like six or seven hundred thousand dollars per unit. Um, that's crazy. That's unsustainable. And in LA, all these units that they're building, they're half empty. So we would argue, you know, notwithstanding the nonprofit industrial complex here, there are, and notwithstanding the people suing the Coalition on Homelessness is a nonprofit, but there are a lot of very good nonprofits around the state that we can learn from and that are really making a difference in treating the individual condition of the homeless. There's um, Father Joe's Villages in San Diego. In Sacramento, we have, it's called St. John's Program for Real Change. Um, there's one in Orange County called the Orange County Rescue Mission. And the one thing they all have in common is they require accountability. You have to be working toward sobriety if you have an addiction. You have to be working toward you know, some kind of job training or um, educational attainment. And that's one of the problems with Housing First is that you are forbidden if you get government money from requiring any form of accountability. You know, even with St. John's program in Sacramento, it is more of a program for women who have been victims of uh, domestic abuse and very troubled situations. And they have a great culinary program. They really transform lives. They lost their county funding because, well, they're a, basically a domestic violence abuse program at heart, and they didn't allow men in. Well, no kidding, they didn't allow men in. <laughs> but that's kind of the thinking behind this, is that even when there is government money available, we kind of have these self-inflicted wounds. So, um, you know, there's a, a, a you know, that, that kind of point that really taxpayers should be asking is, well, we're spending all of this money, and we're not getting any results, why? And isn't it time to do something about it? Legislators are starting to ask questions. Um, they had the first hearings this year where they were actually quizzing, you know, we're spending all this money, yet nothing's changing, why? And I think we need some of that at the state and local level to start getting some much needed conversations about, hey, what we're doing, the status quo isn't working, let's do something different. Josh? And just to add to Tim's point, I guess I should say that while I, I think there are a lot of nonprofits that, there are some nonprofits that are not doing their job properly and are just essentially in the business of existing. Um, there are a lot that do good work and have the right missions and are doing their best in a impossible situation. Um, when it comes to homelessness, and I only try and usually speak specifically to San Francisco because I, I don't know the the way it works in LA or San Diego. Um, I do think that there's a strong possibility this case with the Coalition of Homelessness does go to the Supreme Court. Um, I think that that eventually might have to be something that's decided. When it comes to San Francisco, there isn't enough shelter beds and housing available. And when you look at what our options are, I've said this, a lot of people disagree with me, but I do believe that eventually if San Francisco is gonna try and win this fight and really just have the option to have housing that they're eventually going to move to larger warehouses and they're actually going to do congregate living shelters uh, similar to new york which is basically if we have an, a place to put you you cannot stay on the street and i think that that is something that san francisco officials maybe not talking about it as much yet but eventually if they lose this case could be something that they then start really considering which is always difficult because you've got people who have as you said, very individual needs. Every single person has their own uh, set of circumstances, uh, whether it be you know, economic and job training, whether it be addiction, uh, mental illness, and so whether they have a pet, uh, because obviously you know, people, uh, we all love our pets. Uh, my mom, dog, is kind of a jerk, but like, I mean, <laughs> but like the point is, is that like, you don't want to be all of a sudden have your pet taken from you if you can't, if you can't bring it to a shelter. And so this just adds so many complicating factors. Um, when it comes to chronic homelessness, you know, these are people that take an incredible amount of resources to help. And then we're look, you know, might be need to talk a little bit more about care courts, uh, a program that Governor Newsom's been pushing, which essentially says if you can't care for yourself, uh, you will be essentially forced into a conservatorship that will put you into a system. And I do believe that the reason, tell me if you disagree, but I think care courts 
yeah, I believe it's meant to help people, but I also think it's actually meant to buy time by getting pe the most afflicted people off the streets so that you can serve the people who actually can be put into housing, can get jobs and like get their lives back on track. Um, that's just my own opinion is like, I think care courts is a mechanism to essentially take the people who essentially might not, might be beyond help uh, and really focus the resources on the people that can be served. Yeah, I think I would, I think there's a lot of truth to that. There's also kind of a broader effort that they call homeless courts that are kind of up and running in, in various cities. And it's kind of the carrot and stick approach, you know, that you have the stick of, you know, there is some sort of criminal sanction that you are, you know, potentially in line to receiving. And so if you commit yourself to whatever kind of treatment for sobriety or taking concrete steps to get yourself back on track, well, we have the carrot of we will expunge your record. And so I think there's some sense in that, um, you know, in that kind of thinking. And, you know, we've been, you know, certainly we've applauded, you know, kind of the governor's effort on care courts. I think, though, there's a real legal question on that, too. And I would expect to see that heavily litigated as well, because ultimately, you're kind of asking, you know, are you going to be committing someone kind of against their will? So I could see that heavily litigated as well. Well, I mean, look, but we've tried so many different kinds of courts. There have been drug courts, mental health courts. San Francisco alone has like five different kinds of courts. The problem was um, back after we passed Prop 47 and 57, there's no more stick, right? You talk to people who work at the drug courts and the, the number of people coming through the drug court, it was the thing where if you had a drug, um, a drug possession, um, you know, situation or you were seen or arrested for doing drugs in public back when that was a thing that was a problem uh they, they would arrest you and bring you to drug court and then you would they would say you know you can go to rehab or you can go to jail and you know and that was sort of the situation you helped get people into rehab after prop 57 and 47 the number of people going to drug court went to basically zero because if the, you know, it's rehab or spend one night in jail, then, you know, that's not hard. <laughs> uh, and so, so, you know, you have to have a stick and that is a big part of what is missing, even though we have tried so many times with so many different iterations of different kinds of, of courts. I support them, I, you know, let's do whatever works, but, but you, you, you know, there, there's an element of this that, that is missing and that potentially would at least some part maybe with this court case get resolved where you could say, you know, shelter or, you know, or, or there is something that, that would be detrimental. One, I have one kind of final point on that. We, uh, as part of our free city center, we do a lot of little video tours and uh, interviews with people at different nonprofits and public private partnerships that are, maybe we can learn some are making a difference in urban revitalization. And so we did a tour and we talked to Jim Palmers with the Orange County Rescue Mission, which is one of the nonprofits that I mentioned. And he mentioned talking about the drug issue. He said, when we had Prop 47 and 57, it actually has made the problem of homelessness so much worse because you have the you know, illicit drug activities that, which had already been part of the problem but now they had a funding stream to expand the activities. And he said, until you take care of that, it is gonna be so difficult to make any difference in kind of getting it under the problem. You, you know, you really do need that stick. You really do need the accountability. Final word, Josh? Yeah, and to, to add to, to both of your points, I think the stick has been missing in San Francisco when it comes to uh, enforcement of laws around drugs, but not so much, uh, I wouldn't focus, I'm not gonna focus my comments on the people who are addicted and using drugs, but actually the drug dealers. Uh, last year I wrote a story with a colleague, Anna Tong, and it talked about how then District Attorney Jason, Chase Boudin was actually offering diversionary programs to drug dealers because he is required by law to take their immigration status into account. But according to the experts we talked to, he and his opponents, uh, they would say that he was prioritizing the fact that they were undocumented immigrants and essentially then allowing them to plead down from dealing uh, fentanyl and other drugs to essentially accessory after the fact, which is a weird charge to give someone for dealing drugs because then it says they help someone else commit a crime 
when they were the ones stealing drugs. Uh, our current district attorney, uh, Brooke Jenkins, has changed that pos policy. She is charging drug dealers and drug users more aggressively. Uh, police seem to be actively enforcing the laws more. Um, uh, I would say that there was a sense that maybe they took a couple years off under Boudin uh, to kind of <laughs> stick it to him and prove that his policies were not good and that they also didn't feel like if they, char if they did file a case that it was going to be charged properly. Um, so it's still a little bit too early to, under to know if Brooke Jenkins' policy as dist district attorney are going to bear the results that she says and has promised and that as the endorsement of Mayor Breed and and Supervisor Matt Dorsey and others. Um, but that was a noticeable shift, and, and I guess it speaks to the larger shift we're seeing in politics in the city in which people are fed up, and while San Francisco has got that reputation as a liberal bastion of progressivism, uh, I think we're now seeing that with the way that the school board recall went, the recall of the DA, and certain supervisor races. Uh, we just had an incumbent lose for the first time in district elections over in the sunset. Um, I think we are seeing a noticeable shift, and that will likely lead to some pretty dramatic policy changes over the next year. Okay. Well, let's move on to some less weighty uh, issues. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the people who want to run this country. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> So most of the Republican presidential candidates uh, converged in Milwaukee last week for the first debate, and uh, with the exception of Donald Trump and some other candidates who did not clear the low hurdle to participate. But we got a good sense of the GOP field. And let's kind of start with the, uh, the fun questions. I mean, Tim, who won? Well, I think who won was the viewer who decided to tune in House Hunters or Dr. Pimple Popper <laughs> or Jeopardy or anything else and did not watch that uh, last night. Uh, you know, I kind of look at it as this is a, you know, we always look at it from the national perspective and we focus on the national polls. I kind of look at it from, this was an Iowa debate appealing to the Iowa audience. So who helped themselves the most in Iowa? And if you look at the polling we've seen since, Nikki Haley has gained the most in the polls since Iowa. She's gained about, I think it was seven or eight points in the poll that I saw, um, you know, since Iowa. I think she had a solid night. I think she showed herself well on the stage. Um, she showed strength. She certainly wasn't afraid to school Vivek Ramaswamy about how foreign policy works. Um, and she was also real, I thought. You know, she kind of called out, you know, Mike Pence was making all of these comments on, well, I'm going to do this on abortion and I'm going to do that on abortion. And she said, well, you know, you can say whatever you want. But you don't have 60 votes in the Senate. You're not going to be, do, be able to do any of that. So I kind of appreciated that, that realness. Mm -hmm. The question for her is, can she keep it up? And that's been the knock on her before, is that she's had good moments, but she hasn't kept up that, uh, that momentum. I would say honorable mention was um, DeSantis had an OK night. He certainly did. You know, He gained some in the polls in Iowa. There was nothing memorable, I would say, about his performance. The one thing that I would say was interesting is that when he would give an answer, he actually had some sort of policy accomplishment from Florida you know, that he could add to all those. And you know, I think there's something that you don't see every day, is that politicians not just talking. They actually are saying, well, here's what I did, and here's what I did. So I would say those are the two you know, that I would take away from that debate as having you know, a good night. Yeah, usually politicians are running away from their uh, record. Josh, any thoughts on? Well, I'll let Melissa go first. I'll, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have thoughts, actually, as someone who's lived in Iowa. So, um, but yes. Oh, interesting. Yes. Uh, well, you know, Iowa, first of all, I'll just say, you know, we always get fired up about Iowa, and they always disappoint. Okay, so I was making, I'm making Iowa 2008, Mike Huckabee, 2012, Ron Santorum, 2016, Ted Cruz. Iowa is not indicative of anything. Okay. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Look at New Hampshire. Look at South Carolina. Look at Nevada. These are and and it's not. And there's nothing wrong with Iowa. It's just it's a caucus. It's closed and, and you know and it, it's just a really specific place uh, and a sort of constrained group of voters in the room. And so you know they're lovely people, but they are not bellwether. Yeah. So uh, so uh, and Nikki Haley did great. She passed the you know turn your you know mute your TV. Who looks presidential? She she did right. She wasn't flailing around. She was controlled and seemed really stately. Uh, and so I think she you know, probably did herself some good there. And so if she can do some good in New Hampshire and some other states, that I think that'll be more important. Um, but, but I think that she has clearly been one of the, one of the big winners. Now, here's the thing though. Um, you know, Trump's gonna be the nominee, y'all. <laughs> like, like, it can't be more clear, you know? So what do you mean by win? Is it, you know, your, are your standings going up in terms of the VP, you know, stakes uh, or, or what? But, you know, it's, as long as he's not on the stage, and I'm not saying he should or shouldn't have been up there, but, but the truth is the voters have told us both before and now since um, they are fully on board, the Republican voters who are likely to vote in the primaries are going to vote for Donald Donald Trump. So what we're seeing is basically people trying to get themselves, you know, in the VP slot, in which case, you know, Nikki Haley did a great job. Also, of course, Mr. Ramaswamy did a great job uh, getting him, getting himself some recognition. It was a very Googled name that night. <laughs> so if that's any indicator, uh, he definitely sort of got himself up there. And so now we're seeing some tears shaking out where it's like Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis and um, Vivek Ramaswamy are sort of at the top. And then we've, you know, there's the middle layer of like Chris Christie uh, and a couple of other folks, and then there's the folks who didn't qualify for the debate. So that's kind of how things have shaken out since um, since then. Okay, Josh, report from Des Moines. Oh, <laughs> Josh. Okay, so um, I was before I get to Iowa, I was actually at a political journalism conference in Chicago in the spring, and David Axelrod, uh, former advisor to Obama, who basically helped him get elected and then helped run the White House, him and, uh, gosh, what's... Um, the other uh, gentleman who ran the GOP, uh, who's running the GOP. Um, Reince Priebus. Thank you, Reince Priebus. I always struggle with that name. Uh, he and <laughs> Do David. Do I win the trivia quiz tonight? I'm like, for knowing yeah. the answer to that. Oh, Reince Priebus. <laughs> so Reince Priebus, David Axelrod, and Tom Perez, uh, former head of the DNC, uh, were on stage, and this is April, and it was just essentially like a foregone conclusion that Trump's going to get the nomination. It wasn't even really like any breath wasted on DeSantis or, or anybody else. And I found that to be surprising because at the time, DeSantis had not run a complete train wreck of a campaign. And so, um, you know, it's yet to shoot himself in both feet. So uh, I was, I was kind of surprised by that. But um, having lived in Iowa, so when I, I grew up in uh, Columbia, Missouri, family is in a little town uh, called Pella, Iowa. It's uh, about a half hour from Des Moines, famous for the Dutch bakery and windmills. And um, sell it. It's great, actually. It's a little oasis, like mini Amsterdam, and and without the other fun stuff. And so, um, and so, what happens is, I uh, when I had uh, moved back there for a little bit after college, I worked in a, a small town newspaper in Newton, Iowa. Uh, it's about thirty minutes from Des Moines, and got to know all the people. Wrote a column, and if you're like ever a columnist in a small town newspaper, it is the most bizarre experience. It's like being a D list celebrity and everyone wants to tell you everything but also uh, will tell you how much they disagree with you at the same time <laughs> and and what I find about the the whole caucuses and everything is that if you go to Iowa you as a candidate you have to essentially stop at every diner and eat the pie and that is, and you have to smile no matter how bad it is <laughs> and and I agree that this debate was very much just trying to set up Iowa and cater to them and the problem is is that Iowans uh, by and large are very nice people they like to say Iowa nice um, it, they would be very polite and friendly on uh, first meetings um, they don't they're not indicative of, of the rest of the country and it's really kind of like terrible that Iowa is the first to go. Um, <laughs> go to the Iowa State Farm. You'll never want to go again. Um, and so like, so I would just say that um, the candidates, um, Nikki Haley, I think is certainly the most qualified at this point out of the candidates that I saw. I think um, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, he's clearly just, he's just trying to be the VP. 
Um, I don't think Nikki Haley actually wants to be VP. I think she wants to be president. And I don't think her and Trump would be good running mates. And I think what we've seen, uh, the way that Trump treated Pence, she knows that that's not really an option. And we can probably agree that Pence is not running for vice president either. Uh, no. <laughs> that, I think that really... <laughs> it, just, it just depends what mother says. You know? <laughs> um, I, I think Ramaswamy, though, is uh, the likely... VP candidate at this point. I think he was truly kissing up to Trump. I think he actually understands the playbook where he actually wrote a book and he talked trash about Trump. And just months later, he changes his tune and says how great he is. And it's that kind of like, you know, turn on a dime style yeah. that appeals to Trump, who just, I believe today, was actually talking highly of him. Um, but also like saying he's a little too inflammatory, which is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the cases against Trump are not going to dissuade anyone who already supports him. Uh, he's got his base locked in. I think he, in some ways, you talk about like uh, what we've seen for progressives in San Francisco. There is a base there and they're going to get that number of votes every single time. And that is Trump on a national scale for Republicans. I don't see him being able to increase his base, um, but you know he's certainly not going anywhere, and the nomination is all but locked up. And the yeah. other thing that you know, kind of aside from that part, is it's the party apparatus side of things. You know, and when Trump was in the White House, you know, in pretty much every state, Trump controls the party apparatus and. Um, in many cases, the party rules have been changed for who's awarded delegates and how to favor a Trump. They just did so in California a few weeks ago. They changed the delegate allegation rules that will mean that he probably will get all the delegates in California. So, um, but I will say he is under 50% in Iowa. He is under 50% in New Hampshire. And if you look at, you know, a subject we'll get into, I'm sure, in, in a little bit, you know, the external legal issues <laughs> facing uh, Mr. Trump. There is a, the polling shows there is a significant number of Republicans who would not vote for Mr. Trump if there's a conviction. So we'll get into that in a bit. I have a question for the audience and no help from the panel, please. Uh, does anyone know the name of the mayor of Miami? Oh man, I had a whole bit planned that no one would know who he was. Okay. This is the Commonwealth Club, uh, you know? Yes. <laughs> you have the best oh, audience. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, Francis Suarez, yes, he was a Republican candidate who now is the first one to have dropped out. And I was going to say the reason he dropped out was because no one knows his name. But I had to be talking to the single most informed audience. <laughs> I need new writers. Okay. Um, let's talk about Trump's external legal problems. Um, and okay, so uh, I had the pleasure of intervie interviewing Rick Wilson, a former Republican strategist right on this stage many years ago. I know um, Melissa has also interviewed him for the club. But when I interviewed him, he had just published a book called Everything Trump Touches Dies. And what he was referring to was basically everyone who goes into his orbit, who serves him, who kind of like sells their soul in a way um, to, to do his bidding, uh, they end up getting crushed. And I think we've really seen that this week, and there's probably no better example of it than former New York mayor and former U.S. Uh, attorney Rudy Giuliani, who is <laughs> going through this excruciating public humiliation. And uh, just today, he uh, was, uh, uh, was it today? today or yesterday, a judge issued a default uh, uh, decision against him on this case where these two Georgia um, election workers, you might have heard the story, he had been peddling this lie and he'd been pushing it for like a week or two that they had done some corrupt stuff. And, uh, and this, I guess I want to feel to you, Melissa, the lawyer here, because part of what the judge was doing was saying, um, you did not serve up information for during the discovery process. You have been a, you know, a prosecutor. You've been a high-level attorney you know, 50 years in this, in, at the high levels of legal things, and therefore you really should have known this stuff. And uh, basically, it now moves to the jury, which will decide how much money they got. The jury's not going to decide whether he's guilty. The judge has already issued that 
thing. So it, it now is just a matter of he how admitted. many houses he has to like, sell. I mean, that's why the judge didn't have to do anything. I mean, yeah. like Juliet admitted, like, I knew that this wasn't true and I did it anyway. That's boom, then case over. Right now we're just talking <laughs> about damages, which could be significant because these poor women got, you know, I mean, you know how, how people do. I mean, death threats. I mean, horrible, horrible, um, horrible things happening to them and uh, as a result of, of, of his actions. And so what he had, what he failed to, to disclose is his assets. Right, because he, the, the court needs to know that in order to determine damages to some degree. You need to know how much does someone have so you can figure out how much to take. Uh, and so, and that was the thing, he, he refused and refused. And I can tell you in like nerdy lawyer circles, like we've been forwarding this to each other. Everyone's like, oh my God. It's a 50 page ruling on a discovery issue, right? <laughs> this is crazy. It's usually like a two page thing. A judge is like, hey, turn this over, da, da, da. It's 50 pages just detailing the extraordinary links that this person who should know better went to, to hide his assets in this case. And basically at the end said, you know, we're gonna, you know, you've got about five minutes to get this together, or I'm gonna instruct the jury that you hid this stuff in order to, uh, you know, lessen the penalty against you. So the jury can hear that and know that and punish you even further in a punitive damages situation. And so the whole thing, well, first of all, I was in New York on 9-11 and Julie, uh, seeing him is just so crazy because he was, he was the guy, right? He yeah. was, it wasn't George W. It was him who was the thing that made all of us feel better. And then when Saturday Night Live finally came back after 9-11, it was a big deal. And the first guest was Giuliani because he was the mayor and he was so great. And so this is just so heartbreaking <laughs> to see this sort of fall but but the judge you know was very clear um you know in in the ruling and it is very sad to see sort of you know how how you start going down this road and you can kind of get wrapped up and you know being at the cool kids table and you're I'm on the news I'm on all the cable channels and I'm saying stuff and everybody wants to talk to me and we're we're changing the world and then back to reality. You know, you hurt people, real people, who are just trying to be election workers. Uh, and so it's just, yeah, the whole, the whole the, and this is one of many <laughs> cases, needless to say, uh, involving Giuliani and, and the things that went on with the election. So yeah, very sad, but really extraordinary, really extraordinary um, ruling. Josh, you wrote about attending the uh, GOP watch party for the debate in San Francisco. I guess both of the Republicans from the city were there. So I, I edit, I, <laughs> yeah, I think there were a handful, yeah. yeah. Um, I actually edited that story, but yeah, oh, okay. um, uh, over at uh, Kizar Pub and uh, an institution in its own right. And, um, you know, the, can the, the attendees of the local GOP party, um, you know, they, they had, they wanted to hear from the candidates. They they wanted to see what else is out there. I think they're you know, they're especially when you're in San Francisco. If you're a Republican, which means you're one out of five people at this point, um, you know, you're not going to have a lot of allies to talk about politics with. And I think also uh, I would you know just generally say that a San Francisco Republican is a little bit different than like you know Middle America in the South. Um, I think the the kind of liberal uh, viewpoint that people in California and San Francisco specifically have uh, gives a little bit more nuance to the politics that people hold uh, dear because people were um, talking about uh, women's rights and, and reproductive health care and how that's a major issue to them. And that's not something that you're going to usually hear on a uh, GOP debate stage. Um, when it comes to the legal issues, I definitely would defer to Melissa and Tim on this, but I would just say that I think Giuliani has been an abject disaster. It's like watching someone fall down for five years. And like, you know, it's like, you know, see someone like slow-mo crash and it just gets <laughs> more and more disturbing the longer you watch. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think this is unfortunately a hallmark of the Trump administration and campaigns is that he surrounds himself with people who want power for the sake of power. And that's what it's always been about. It's never really actually been about uh, really advancing a cause from what I've ever seen. I've always viewed it as uh, Trump is, is very much wanting to be in control and usually at the uh, benefit financially to himself and his acolytes. And so I think Rudy Giuliani 
is just the purest example maybe of someone who hangs on to stay relevant and feel uh, like they're in the spotlight. And unfortunately, to Melissa's point, you know, that's someone who came, came forward and really in one of the darkest moments in our nation's history really was a, a leader was someone that actually showed up, was brave, uh, you know, gave us a sense of security that everyone was lacking. And, uh, you know, when historians look back, it's going to be the most complicated figure. Um, but he won't be taught in Florida, so it'll be fine. <laughs> Wait, I have a question about what you said earlier about people polling, people in polls saying that if there's a conviction, though, right. okay, now that's the line right. we're going to draw there. Like, do you believe that? Because it seems to me like maybe the line keeps moving, or they say that, and then the conviction, they go, oh well, then that's a it's a dumb conviction, it's a corrupt conviction, the judge right. screwed up. We, I mean, like we meant like, all four cases needed. Right, right. Well, you know what right. I mean? Like, right. like, is it is the I. I wonder if that's true, that if people are right. being honest with themselves, or they'll, they'll find a way to make the conviction not real, and so they'll be able to hang on to their support. What's interesting, too, is in the same poll that I saw, it was an AP Ipsos poll, there are actually different numbers for he is convicted of a federal crime versus on election day he will be serving time in prison. <laughs> Now, I thought it was interesting they felt the need to distinguish between those two, uh, between those two questions. My gut tells me you're probably right. I think there's no question there is a chunk of Republicans who won't vote for Trump if there's a conviction. The question is how big is that number? And are those people who are already voting for one of the other candidates who are running in the race today? The other question is, you know, it seems like, you know, we are headed for another pretty close general election in the key battleground states. And suburban voters, you know, many of whom are probably, you know, Republican voters on the fence, more moderate Republicans, they're probably going to decide the election. And so they're going to face the choice between, you know, a potential, an indicted and maybe convicted Trump and a Biden, who they probably don't like his record on the economy and other things. And so that, to me, is going to be fascinating. You know, and then you get into this debate that's you know, a, a great discussion in, in kind of more academic settings is, is there going to be a third choice? And what would the impact of that be in a Wisconsin if you have a Cornell West on the ballot who could get two or three or four percent of the vote? Or they're talking about this no labels movement that's supposed to appeal to uh, more moderate voters. But if it's this kind of choice again that, you know, Americans overwhelmingly say we do not want to have to make this same choice again, well, if that is the choice that we seem to be headed toward, gosh, I, I'm going to be interested to see. But there's no question that there will be a not insignificant chunk of Republicans who would not vote for him. The question is just how many, and is it anybody new? Is, you know, it's always politics is a game of math. You know, are these people who are already off the reservation or are there, you know, folks who are going to join them after a potential conviction? And, and I don't think it needs to be a big percentage no. of them because there are so many states where it's a razor thin. And then there are other states where it does not matter. California is not going to be right. won by a Republican candidate if, if he was, like, just handing out candy and, and ponies right. to everybody. <laughs> um, right. Well, uh, and Alabama's not going for Biden. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's the thing that's a, a bit of a shame about the way that our system is set up for national elections, um, particularly, obviously, the president, because um, at the conference I was at, uh, Axelrod and, and others previous, they all agreed this race is going to be decided by 40,000 people, and they exist in four states. And that is just maddening. Just think how much money we can all save. If, and, and the campaigns, too. They don't need to spend a billion dollars each on advertising. They just advertise in you know, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, probably by now. Is, it's, it's super controlled by the Democrats. So chances are that's a, a Biden state. But what's the, what are the other? Arizona, Georgia. Arizona, Georgia, yeah. I mean, focus all your money on that. The rest of us could just sit back and eat bonbons and watch it. Because it doesn't matter who we vote for. <laughs> for the amount they're going to spend, they could buy them all a house. 
Right. <laughs> right. Well, I'm from Georgia, so I want my people to get some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is something that uh, we probably all know, but don't spend a lot of time thinking about, is that a lot of races, especially in California, whether they be uh, propositions or ballot measures or candidates, these are people that are running to essentially support the political industrial complex, which is consultants and pollsters. And, and so I, I have had you know, suspicions of my own that in some ways the recall of Gavin Newsom was motivated so that people who saw an opportunity could get paid a salary for a couple of years. Now, I, this is outside the norm, I think, for most people, but I did look into it, and I think they saw the polling was there, they knew that they probably would fail with the recall, but they did it anyway because they could actually make an incredible amount of money on a recall, tapping into that anger and angst that many people felt during the pandemic. I'd also say, though, if Newsom had screwed up just one more time after the French Laundry, I think he could have actually <laughs> lost. Right? So it was a, it's a gamble worth right. it. But like when you think about all the operations that are going to happen in you know, a presidential race in states that don't really matter, it's a lot of people just getting paid. Look, beware of political consultants <laughs> with a PowerPoint. Yes. That shows you how you can win. <laughs> That's how people like, you know, like Asa Hutchinson, like get into the race. They go, I, you know, well, I talked to some fine young people who I'm also now paying. Um, and they told, they showed me the path to victory. And you're like, okay. Um, but, the, you know, there's a very self-serving, you know, system of incentives for people in this political industrial complex to, yes. to keep a bunch of people in the race, to keep a mm -hmm. bunch of things on the ballot and to keep things going and to keep things going in states that you know don't really That's right. matter. And they are not showing you how you can win. They're showing you how can we spend your money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tim Miller, who's been a frequent week to week panelist, of course wrote his book, uh, Why We Did It. And this was kind of his coming to terms with his past as one of those political strategists and how many of them he, I remember the one part where he was talking about, uh, he was talking to someone who was a campaign high up for, I forget, some major Republican, and he said, I don't think this person's ever voted for a Republican for president. You know, and, and he here was working for like some hardcore uh, Republican running for office. So yeah, there's, there's a whole different world and mindset there. Thank you all for showing up. Thank you to our great panel, Melissa Kane, Josh Kane, Tim Anaya. Thanks to all of you and everyone watching and listening online. Have a great week. Stay safe. We'll see you again in the future.